My name is Robert Maynard, and Father asked me to speak about uh, the church, Peter the Rock, the Chair, and the Keys. When presented with the topic of Peter as the Rock and the Chair and the Keys, the rock on which Jesus would build his church, I felt a little challenged. What does this really mean? I know that Peter was the first pope and all the pope's successors to Peter, but if confronted with from one of my Protestant friends, could I explain the Catholic view? Could I quote the scriptures the way so many other Christian faiths could? In Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says to Simon, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church. It seems simple enough, right? But to so many other Catholic faiths, it's not that simple. The English translation of the name Peter is taken from the Greek word Petros, but the word for rock is Petra. The word Petros meant some little stones or pebbles. That's where the argument comes in. Jesus was calling Peter a pebble, Petros, and on a rock, Petra, he would build his church, meaning Jesus himself would be the foundation of the church. That's their argument. As Greek scholars, even some non, even non-Catholic ones admit, the words Petros and Petra were synonyms in the first century Greek. They meant small stone and large rock. Both words pretty much meant both. In some ancient Greek poetry, centuries before the time of Christ, but the distinction had disappeared from the language by the time that Matthew's gospel was rendered in Greek. In the Greek of the time, both Petros and Petra simply meant rock. If Jesus had wanted to call Simon a small stone, the Greek word lithos would have been used at the time. But remember that Jesus didn't speak Greek. He spoke Aramaic, just as the apostles and all the Jews in Palestine spoke at the time. Aramaic was the common language of the place, not Greek. So even the Greek was a translation from the original language. We know that Jesus spoke Aramaic because some of the words are preserved for us in the gospels. Look at Matthew 27, 46, where he says from the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That isn't Greek, that is Aramaic. It means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's more, in Paul's epistles, four times in Galatians and four more times in 1 Corinthians, we have the Aramaic form of Simon's new name preserved for us. In our English Bibles, it comes out as Cephas. That isn't Greek. That's a transliteration of the Aramaic word kepha. And what does kepha mean? It means rock the same as Petra. It doesn't mean a little stone or a pebble. What Jesus said to Simon in Matthew 16, 18 was this, you are Kepha, and on this Kepha, I will build my church. When you understand what the Aramaic says, you see that Jesus was equating Simon and the rock. He wasn't contrasting them. He was making them the same thing. We see this vividly in some modern English translations which render the verse this way, you are rock and upon this rock, I will build my church. But wait a second, if Kepha means the same as Petra, why don't we read that in Greek? You are Petra and on this Petra, I will build my church. Why for Simon's new name, does Matthew use a Greek word Petros, which means something quite different from Petra? Because he had no choice. Greek and Aramaic have a different grammatical structure. In Aramaic, you can use kepha in both places in Matthew 16, 18. In Greek, you encounter a problem because the nouns take different gender endings. In ancient Greek, you have masculine, feminine, and neutral nouns. The Greek word petra is feminine. You can use it in the second half of Matthew 16, 18 without any trouble but you can't use it as Simon's new name because you can't give a man a feminine name. At least that, back then you couldn't. You can ha change the ending of the noun to make it masculine. When you do that, you get Petros, which was an already existing word meaning rock. It's an imperfect rendering of the Aramaic. 
you lose part of the play on words. In English, where we have Peter and rock, you lose all of it, but that's the best you can do in Greek. Beyond the grammatical evidence, the structure of the narrative does not allow for a downplaying of Peter's role in the church. Look at Matthew 16, 15 through 19. Look at the way it's structured. After Peter gives a confession about the identity of Jesus, the Lord does the same in return for Peter. Jesus does not say, blessed are you, Simon, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are an insignificant pebble, and on this rock I will build my church. He doesn't say that. Jesus is giving Peter a threefold blessing, including the gift of the keys to the kingdom, not undermining his authority. To say that Jesus is downplaying Peter is contrary to the context. Jesus is installing Peter as the form of a church of a chief steward or prime minister under the king of kings by giving him the kings to the keys to the kingdom. As can be seen in Isaiah 22, 22, kings in the Old Testament appointed a chief steward to serve under them in a position of great authority to rule over the inhabitants of the kingdom. Jesus quotes almost verbatim from this passage in Isaiah, and so it is clear what he has in mind. He is raising Peter up as a father figure to the household of faith to lead them and guide the flock, as in John 21, 15 through 17. This authority of the prime minister under the king was passed on from one man to another down through the ages by the giving of the keys, which were worn on the, on the shoulder as a sign of authority. Likewise, the authority of Peter has been passed down for 2,000 years by the means of the papacy. When Jesus, after his resurrection, then solemnly instructs Peter to feed my lambs, watch over my sheep, and feed my sheep in John 21, the ramifications are enormous. Throughout the Old Testament, God himself is understood to be the good shepherd. He promises to come and be the shepherd of his people through his servant David. When Jesus Christ, the son of David, fulfills this prophecy, God's promise is kept. Then before Jesus returns to heaven, he commands Peter to take charge of his pastoral ministry. Now Peter will undertake the role of the good shepherd in Christ's place. This is why the Pope is called the Vicar of Christ. But what is a vicar? The word vicar simply stands for one who vicariously stands in for another person. A vicar is someone to whom a job is delegated. The three strands of biblical imagery, rock, steward, and shepherd, show in three different ways that Jesus intended Peter to exercise his ministry and authority here on earth. In other words, to act as his vicar. The fact that there are three images is important because the authors of scripture believe the number three to be one of the perfect numbers. A statement was most authoritative when it was expressed three times in three different ways. We see this in the passage of John 21. Jesus gives his pastoral authority to Peter with three solemn commands. Feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. Here, Jesus delegates his authority three times in three different ways using imagery found throughout the Old Testament. In doing so, he clearly reveals his delegation of authority to Peter. History shows that from the earliest days, Christians considered Peter to be the very rock, steward, and shepherd that Jesus proclaimed him to be. Furthermore, from the earliest days, they considered his successor to be the Bishop of Rome, and that the Bishop of Rome endures today as rock, steward, and shepherd, just a few hundred yards from the site of Peter's death and burial. Does the Catholic Church build the claims to papal authority on one verse taken out of context? Hardly. The three strands of rock, steward, and shepherd are woven in and through the whole of Scripture, coming into focus in the life of Jesus Christ, who is the true rock, the kingdom of, king of the kingdom and good shepherd, who, and who hands his authority on earth to Peter until he comes again. A non-Catholic might protest against the successive nature of the papacy, that the Pope is the direct continuing successor of Peter. However, the whole context and meaning of the imagery from the beginning to the end is to show that a ministry must be successive. First, the image of the rock by its very nature is timeless and everlasting. That's why the image of the rock was chosen. That's how rocks are, they're there to stay. Then in Matthew 16, Jesus himself says that the steward's ministry will have an eternal dimension. 
He holds the kings of keys to the kingdom of God and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Finally, the image of the shepherd, as we have seen, is an eternal one because God himself is the ultimate good shepherd. If the rock, the steward, and the shepherd are indeed eternal ministries, then for them to last that long, the ministry must be successive. They must outlive Peter. The eternal ministry could have died out without Peter himself and still have been eternal. Thank you.